10. There's a couple of things I want to point out in those two verses. The background for my message this morning actually covers five whole chapters in the book of Numbers, chapter 11 through 17. And I would encourage you this morning after you leave the service and go home to take your Bible, sit down and read those five chapters. It deals with the children of Israel and some things that were going on that the Lord was not really that happy with. And we are the children, not of Israel, we're the children of the Lord today. And basically all across the globe, there's no difference between people, only what opportunities have been provided to them. But basically human, uh, humans are the same everywhere. So if the Lord had trouble with the Israelites back then, I would suspect he's having trouble with the church today. <laughs> right? Humanity is basically the same everywhere. Brother Porter, if you could read to me Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, and then skip down to verse number 10. When the people complained and displeased the Lord. Oh, when the people what? Complained. When the people, say that word again. Complained. When the people complained, what happened? It displeased the Lord. It did what? It displeased the Lord. Displeased the Lord. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. Oh. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay, we need to back up there just again. What was the reaction there? The Lord heard it. He heard the complaining. What next? His anger was kindled. Oh, oh why? I don't want the Lord to get mad at me. Right? His anger was kindled. Go ahead. So what happened? And the fire the of the Lord burnt among them. Fire of the Lord burnt among them. There's judgment that came because of it. And consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the earth. Yeah. Fried them. Okay. Verse 10 now, right? Then that was verse 1. Now verse 10. Ooh. So not only the Lord heard what was going on, Moses, the leader, heard what was going on. He also was displeased. Now, can I make a long story short here this morning? When God is displeased and God's man is deceased, displeased, pity help you. <laughs> right? I mean, one would be enough, wouldn't it? Okay, so my subject this morning, when God is not happy. Wow, when God is not happy. I mean to say the text that our brother read this morning, Numbers chapter 11, verse 1 and verse 10. God was displeased. He was ticked. And it tells us there the thing that he was ticked about. It was the complaining people. We sang a song this morning, To Be Like Jesus. On earth, I long to be like him. Well, I'll tell you what, when Jesus was here on earth, he did a lot of good, and you don't find anywhere where he complained. To be like Jesus. So as a theme this morning, all of our complaints. It's a four-part message. I want to talk, number one, about the sin of complaining. Two, what was it that they, the children of Israel, were complaining about? There was four things, not just one, that they were complaining about. And then number three, you talked to you about when the leadership, that was Moses in that instance, was not pleased. And then number four, we're going to need an intercessor to stand in the gap if there's any hope for us. All right? Now, the objective of me preaching the message of this morning when God is not happy or he's angry or displeased we need to make you aware of the gravity of the actions when we complain. God doesn't take it lightly. Complaining is a condition of the heart. We need to get that this morning. Complaining is a condition of the heart. It comes from an unthankful disposition. 
Now, you and I know as well this morning that there are some people that you couldn't please no matter how, how hard you try. Misery is bound up in their genes, part of their nature, part of their DNA <laughs> or personality. Now, someone's already got ahead of me and said, you preached that just a little while ago. Anybody want to confess to that? <laughs> ah, my wife. Actually, it was a year and a half ago. It was on February the 4th, 2018, I preached a similar message about complaining. Uh, I didn't reference that clear until I had prepared this one in total, and I went back to find out when I had preached. So this is a totally new message. There's a lot you can say on the subject. All right, now, but when I preached about the sin of complaining one and a half years ago, I think everyone saw the gravity of what it is to complain. Matter of fact, at the door I had several tell me it was a great message. I think that morning everyone repented of the sin of complaining and that was the end of it, right? I mean, no one has ever complained since then. Right? Now, I got the response I was looking for this morning, some sticker and some laugh, and you say, why is that? You know I'm being facetious. But I'm just trying to lay a groundwork of the necessity why I must preach it again. Right? Okay. You know where I'm going. So... I already mentioned I never referenced the last message until I was done completing this one, so it's pretty different uh, if you took notes on that last one. I actually surprised myself when I looked that one up and saw the date when I preached it. The text was the same. That surprised me. Although this time it's not just chapter 11 and 12, I've added three to it. <laughs> 13, 14, and on through to 17. Now, how many has ever heard the saying? When mama's not happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, that's it. having reference to a home or a marriage. you got to keep the lady of the house happy or you're going to pay for it. Ain't nothing more miserable than an unhappy woman. Oh, my. I was reading in the scripture this week, and I found something worse than an unhappy woman. It's an unhappy God. Oh my. When God ain't happy, it ain't funny. All right? Matter of fact, he made a claim on his own behalf in the scripture that he's a jealous God. He didn't want you flirting around with any other God. Makes him mad. So that's one thing that makes him mad. That's one thing that stirs his anger. One thing that makes him displeased and not happy when you decide that you're going to search elsewhere and try to find or worship or give attention to another God. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2, 2 and verse 9, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a peculiar people. Now, when he said peculiar, he didn't mean odd. He meant belonging exclusively to one. And that meant, I've chosen you. I've purchased you. You're mine. <laughs> what business you got looking for some other God? That really ticks me. So when God isn't happy, his representative here on earth, his ambassadors, the ministry, the man of God, the leadership should not be pleased as well. An example of that, if you look into the Old Testament, anyone ever read the Old Testament prophets? Yeah. How many would rather read the New Testament? I'll confess, I, I love to read the New Testament. Don't get in the Old Testament a lot, especially the, the ma major and minor prophets. You say, why? Oh, man, every time I read it, I, I, I almost get mad myself. It's gloom and doom. <laughs> Why was it gloom and doom, the major prophets? Because when God's not happy, his man on earth is not happy, and he's just got to tell it. 
And that was the Old Testament prophets. They had to relate to God's people why God wasn't happy. And so we see the major and minor prophets filled with gloom and doom, prophecies about judgment and punishment one after another. It was actually punishment against the nations for their treatment of Israel. They weren't in treating Israel very good. And God wasn't happy about that, so it was one judgment after another. Now, those prophecies from the Old Testament prophets were not just empty threats. God meant what he said. He's a man of his word or a God of his word. So now, it's one thing for God to be mad at the enemy. Did you get that? It's one thing for God to be mad at the enemy. Quite something different when he's mad at his own children. Wow. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're parents here today, I hope. There's probably times when you were raising your kids, you was ticked at the government, the school, the workplace, the neighbor, another most or something. They did something to my kid. Right? I mean, you got mad because someone touched one of your little ones. Quite different when you yourself are mad at your kid. Now, is that right? <laughs> Here, I'm telling you, God was mad at his own children, not just the enemy. Well, what was it that God was mad about that his own children were doing? What made him so angry and displeased? I mean, he was ticked. We already heard one. It was the complaining. I'll deal more about that in a minute. It's when you, let's say, backside are going a whoring is what the scripture says. After other gods... Those things make him angry and stir up his anger. And I've already said when he's mad, it's not funny. Now, what I want to talk about this morning is not him being jealous about you flirting with another God. That's not the big problem here. Uh, but the sin that was he was displeased with in our text is that of complaining. I mean, God was not very pleased about that. He got angry. He is displeased when his own children complain. Well, what is the things he complains about? I'm going to mention four here. It's over the things that he himself has provided for them. Everyone else here in the uh, cliche, easy come, easy go? <laughs> what do children complain about most? The things that are provided for them, free of charge. Correct? So we're not dealing with jealousy here for flirting. It was complaining against the things that he provided for his own children free of charge. Complaining is the sin that's making him angry in the text that I have chosen here this morning. Freebies that ought to be appreciated and many times are not. Now, it's one thing to complain about the cook. It's quite something different when you complain about the groceries or the ingredients, the raw materials the cook's got to work with. So why? Because God provides the raw material. The cook just puts it together in different ways. So quite different when you complain against the cook, but something different when you complain about what God has provided. So dealing with that sin of complaining, number one here. What was it God had provided? Now, as a parent, and hopefully this didn't apply to you, your own child or someone else's kid didn't like what you gave them, free for nothing. Took in their hands, threw a hissy fit, temper tantrum, threw it on the floor, busted it up. It's now destroyed the thing that you gave to them. What's your reaction? I'll tell you what mine is. I ain't thinking about the scuff of the neck and give him a good tuning. As a matter of fact, you get nothing else. That's my reaction. All right, probably was yours too. And uh, needs a good spanking and an attitude adjustment. Because when people show that they're displeased that way, uh, it really turns my crank for sure. As a matter of fact, let me press the, the button a little bit further. I'm appalled when I see a parent in town with a kid that's throwing a hissy fit 
and they've just thrown a toy that's not even bought for them yet on the floor and busted all the pieces. Now, some stores have a policy, you break it, you own it. <laughs> all right? And that's a good policy to have. But anyway, if you give a kid what they want when they're throwing a hissy fit, it reinforces bad behavior. In other words, they learn to throw a hissy fit every time because they can get what they want that way. <laughs> Again, it turns my crank the other way. I give them a good spank, say nothing. Do you know what? In the scripture, it said there, I point out when Brother Porter read it, that God heard their complaining, and he did respond. How did he respond? Number one, his anger was kindled. Number two, he was pleased. And number three, I shake my head at this one, he gave them what they asked for. I mean, if I'd have been God, I'd have struck him dead. <laughs> what are you doing, Lord? I mean, I'm taking a double take. They deserve to spank and they deserve judgment. You're reinforcing bad behavior. You gave them what they wanted for them throwing their hissy fit. The scripture says he gave them flesh, meat. It's what they lusted for. He sent quail in in abundance, as a matter of fact, three feet deep. We have to go hunting for partridge today. All right, can you imagine quail coming in three feet deep? He gave them what he knew was not good for them. Any parent ever give their car a kid when they know it was going to kill them? Gave them what they wasn't good for them? Well, same difference. Oh, but you see, there's a catch here. You were waiting for that, weren't you? What was the catch? Now, God may have given them quail to satisfy their lust, their desire, their hissy fit, and give it an abundance, three feet deep, you can swim in it. But at the same time, he sent leanness to their soul. What do we mean? Well, there's, it was like spiritual suicide. Now, them quails weren't good for them. Uh, there was something in the meat that was like a deadly poison. I mean, you eat quail, you're going to die. <laughs> you might not today, but the Lord put something in them ones. Right? He gave them what he knew was not good for them. Well, what was it they were complaining about? Here's the four things. God's provisions, his raw materials, his free resources. Number one, they were complaining about the manna. What was manna? That was bread from heaven. It was free every day. I mean, have you ever heard tell of a cow complaining about eating grass every day? I don't think so. God provided it for the cow. He's glad to have it. Stuffs himself right full, then burps it up and chews it again and swallows it. Huh? Cow just loves to eat green grass that the Lord has provided free every day for nothing. But God's children are different than that. They like a lot of variety. I hate the same thing day after day. I mean, this manna, it's free, God provided it. But uh, it wasn't like the cucumbers back in Egypt. I mean, we like to work the ground, we like to plant the seed, we like to cultivate harvest and then eat the cucumber. Something wrong with their heads, huh? You want it free or do you want to work for it? Free bread from heaven, miracle bread, sweet to the taste like a coriander seed and honey. Keep in mind, it was God's provision, and it was free. All you had to do was go out and gather it every morning. Well, that's too much like work, I guess. An omer per head. 
In other words, it's like a, a quart size. Quart of bread per day per individual. They were the sick of the same thing every day. I mean, they wanted some variety. They wanted the leeks, the onions, the garlics, the cucumbers that they had back in Egypt. You know, it would be nice out here in the wilderness to have an Egyptian stir fry. I mean, how many ways can you prepare manna? You can eat it dry. Probably not too much butter out in the wilderness. No jam. No peanut butter or cheese whiz, not even any ketchup. Well, I suppose you could try to toast it if there's a fire around or make a sandwich, but it's still bread. Bread is a staple food, and it was given to them by God. Now, I just want to back up here and just punch this a little bit more. You know, it really bothers me when I see Christian people complain about their food at a restaurant. Oh, that took too long to come. I'm not going to pay for that. Then tell them you're a Pentecostal. Or that you're a Christian. It's not cooked right. And not enough salt or too much salt. And uh, you charge me too much for that. And, and so I, I feel justified in not leaving a tip. Oh, man, poor Christian testimony. And it wasn't the waiter that determined the price anyway. So you chalk it up to some poor service and you took out your displeasure on an innocent waiter. You know what that is? That's an indication of an unhappy soul. There really was nothing wrong with the food or the cook. Say, how do you know that? Just observe around the restaurant whole bunch of other people eating the same thing without complaint. Where's the problem? It's you. Oh my, it's quiet here this morning. I mean, there are some people, even some Christians, you couldn't please if you wanted to. They're just plain miserable. Misery is intertwined in their DNA. Well, that's enough said about the food. I'd like to tell you this morning, I'm thankful. I don't even know what it is to be hungry. Wow. Isn't that a lot to be thankful for? Oh, yeah. Lord, I give you thanks. It's not my notes. I remember I was working over in Newfoundland. Donnie Kirsten and I, we was building a fence for this guy. He claimed to be a Pentecost of some sort, another Christian. Invited us in for some tea mid-morning and put some tea and some donuts out there, and we were waiting. He looked at us, what are you waiting for? We're waiting for you to say grace. Oh, he said, I don't say grace. What? You're not thankful for it? Oh, yeah, he said, I bless the groceries when I buy them. Well, why not just go bless the grocery store? I don't have to give thanks once a year. I mean, any time that we can give thanks, we ought to be able to give thanks because our God is worthy of it. Oh, hallelujah. The second thing that these folks were complaining about was the ministry. God-given leadership. I mean, there were no restaurants in the wilderness, right? So they couldn't take their uh, misery out on the waiter, so next they decided to pick on the leader. Their leader was Moses, so they went after him with their hot tongues. Moses, you're the one that got us in this mess. You should have left us alone back in Egypt. At least we'd have had some stir fry and a place to bury our dead. Moses is there thinking, oh yeah. You forgot about all the hard labor. You forgot about the tale of the bricks. You forgot about your own sighing and crying and asking for deliverance and relief. You were in bondage. Oh, how soon do you forget? Yeah, I might be the leader, but I'm in the doghouse either way. Prayed for you to get you out of here. Now you're out of here and you want to go back. I mean, what's the use of a leader anyway? Let's move on to the next one, okay? Something else they complained about. Or it appeared this way. Mixed marriage. Moses, the leader, had married an Ethiopian woman. Can you imagine racism back in Bible days? 
And there's still racism today. There shouldn't be. Yeah. Well, Moses was in a situation. He had married an Ethiopian. Now, it wasn't really the color or the person. When someone doesn't like you, they'll find all manner of things wrong with you to pick you apart. It was Moses they were trying to pick apart, not his wife. Right now, obviously, there was some racism or prejudice back then. It goes clear back to Noah's day. Noah had a son whose name was Ham. Ham uncovered his father's nakedness in a tent. It was uh, Ham's son, be Noah's grandson, whom Noah cursed for that being happened. As part of a cursed race, they settled in Africa. Now, if you don't know your geography, Ethiopia is part of Africa. So in all likelihood, Moses' Ethiopian wife was black. Right? Well, what else they got to complain about? Their inheritance. Well, complaining about an inheritance. Something they received for nothing. Didn't have to work for. It was the wishes of either mom and dad. Here it was the land of Canaan. And I'm telling you what, the Lord made it so his people was set up for life. In like a Garden of Eden or like a utopia. Automatic wealth, a property, a land that was given to them by God. A land flowing with milk and honey. You know what? They get into the land. They didn't. They weren't thankful for the milk and honey. They must have given thanks before they got to the land so they didn't have to pray for their groceries when they get in the land. All right? They get into the land. They didn't see all the good fruit in the land. They saw giants. It was their focus, wasn't it? They focused on the bad rather than the good. They would have to conquer the giants and drive them out, but... Ah, oh, lazy, no bunch of good-for-nothing complainers. Ungrateful. Lord, why don't you just wipe them out? You know, the Lord had that thought. Until Moses stepped between them and God. Oh, you see, God was not the only one that was displeased right now. The leader was not pleased either. Verse number 10, it said, Moses also was displeased. I mean, it's only right when God isn't pleased that his leadership on earth should not be pleased at the things that God's not pleased with. Yeah, I miss Alan this morning. I got a good amen out of that one. Huh? I mean, when God's not pleased, his man here on earth that right shouldn't be pleased. We see many exceptions to that day. So what is that? God's not pleased with some things, but the ministry's promoting the opposite. <coughs> oh, when God's not pleased, the preacher shouldn't be pleased either. We can't accommodate sin. Leadership should be in agreement, in synchronization, in unity with God. If God's not pleased... The preacher shouldn't be pleased. But I'll tell you something. When both God and his man or his leader here on earth both are displeased, oh man, you're in deep trouble. Right? You better be thankful for a leader who's in synchronization and unity with God that when God is displeased, he also is displeased. Now, under the Old Testament law, you had no, mat or no matter in the say of who would be your leader or your leadership. Matter of fact, it was the Lord that raised up Moses to be their leader. He was supposed to die under uh, Pharaoh's command. But it was Pharaoh's own daughter that providentially spared and raised up Moses, and he was raised by his own mother. I mean, look at that, would you? That's awesome, isn't it? Moses was the one who chose his successor. Not only was he chosen, he chose his brother Aaron and his descendants. 
chosen, cleansed, and anointed by the Lord. And that was to happen throughout their generations. And the Lord reinforced that by causing Aaron's dry rod to bud, flower, and bring forth fruit in one night. I'm going to mention that just a little bit later. God chose the leadership. So God's not pleased when you murmur, or grumble, or complain about his God-given leadership over your soul. Brother McNair mentioned this a little bit last week uh, in past appreciation, Hebrews 13, 17, to submit to your leadership, to obey them. They're the ones that watch for your soul and give an account, and they need to give an account with joy and not with grief. I don't know if he touched on the scripture in Psalms 105 and 15 or not, where it says, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. When you touch God's anointed or his chosen leadership, you're in trouble. Say, why? Because this time, it's not just leanness that he sends to your soul. It's leprosy that he sends, which is a fatal disease, both spiritually and physically. That's what happened to Miriam, wasn't it? She complained about her leadership, happened to be her own brother, spoke against his marriage, spoke against him. It was his own brother, but she was smitten with leprosy by God. It was God's judgment for complaining about the spiritual leadership that he had provided for her. Leprosy is a type of sin. If a person had leprosy, they were cut off from God. Can't go to church anymore. I mean, not only were they cut off from God, they were cut off from their family. They were placed outside the camp in quarantine. Uh, separated and isolated because leprosy was a very contagious disease. I mean, you hang around people, you got leprosy, they're going to get leprosy too. Leprosy was a plague with the sentence of death, and there was no known cure for leprosy. So leprosy could not be tolerated in the camp. They were unclean. Wow. Complain about the manna? Leanness to your soul. Complain about the ministry? Leprosy. It's getting more serious each time, isn't it? Now, what about Israel themselves? God said to Moses, Moses, (laughs) step aside. I'm not happy what's going on. I'm going to kill every one of them. You familiar with that in the scripture? Moses, oh Lord! If you smite them, smite me with them. I mean, these were my people. You rose me up and put me through all those tests and and ten plagues over Egypt to lead them out. And and, uh, we're out here in the wilderness. We're headed towards the promised land. The people of the land is going to say, you just brought us out here to wipe us out. Oh, Lord, please reconsider. Don't do that. Moses was the intercessor that stepped between God and those miserable children. Now get this. The scripture said Moses was a meek man above all that were on the face of the earth. I'm glad the leadership was meek. I already told you what my attitude is sometimes when I see a parent, (laughs) you know, giving a kid what they want when they take a hissy fit. I'm like, God, kill them. Right? We need leadership that's meek like Moses that will stand between God and his people and say, God, please. These people are human. I'm human. I know what it's like. I was a complainer at one time. Oh, Lord, help us in our human frailties. Moses stepped between the people and God, and God heard Moses. Let me give you another example. Do you remember Korah and his sons? 250 of them. The earth opened up and swallowed them. They perished in a moment. What happened? They were speaking against the leadership. Earth opened up and 250 perished right away. That's in Numbers chapter 16. Here was their complaint. We're just as good as Aaron and the sons, and we want to do the work of the ministry. They didn't know their place. They were stepping out of line. 
And when you speak against God's anointed leadership, the sentence of death will be upon you physically and spiritually. Wow. It's just better to heed God's word and not go near anything that would displease the Lord or his man. I marvel that immediately, oh, this makes me shake my head too, immediately after the people saw 250 people perish right before their eyes, immediately they went to Moses and started complaining again. Duh! I mean, come on, didn't you see what just happened? You're playing with instant death. As a matter of fact, at that moment, the Lord sent a plague of death among them, and 14,700 of them perished before Aaron could get into the tabernacle to make atonement for them. Wow. Wow. That was serious, wasn't it? The plague stayed after Aaron got into the tabernacle and made atonement, but in the meantime, there's 14,700 that perished for complaining and speaking even against the ministry. Now, I've got a sideline here. I could go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verses 16 to 19, and give you a list of seven things that the Lord hates or that would stir up his anger, kindle his anger. I haven't got time to go into it, but I'll just read it and then go, Okay. Six things the Lord hates, yea, seven, abomination to him, proud look, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, heart that devises wicked imagination, feet swift to running mischief, false witness speaking lies, and he that sows discord among the brethren. I mean, you want to get mad, God? Try that. Don't tick God or your leadership. And for goodness sake, don't tick them both at once. So Why? Let me go back to Moses again. Number four here in my message, you need an intercessor. It's your only hope. The only hope for Israel was Moses, the intercessor. The only hope for Miriam was her brother, Moses, the intercessor. The Bible talking about him as a meek man. In meekness, he prayed for someone that rose up against him. Wow, that takes meekness, doesn't it? It's more human to seek revenge and stand back and say, go ahead, God, smite him. He stood in between as an intercessor. I pray today that our leadership will be meek like Moses. You say, why? We need the office or the ministry of interceding, of mediatorship. Now, yeah, we do. You know what happened? Numbers chapter 13. Didn't I tell you when you go home and read these chapters, you get the whole story? Numbers chapter 13, it was time for the camp to move from where they were to the next place. Where's Miriam? She's still outside the camp with leprosy. She's about to be left behind and forgotten forever. Moses went to God on her behalf and said, Lord... What are we going to do with Miriam? You're wanting us to move. We can't leave her behind. Wow, thank God for meek leadership. All right, that prayed for one that rose up against him and still wanted to take them along rather than to leave them behind forever. An intercessor, her own brother, beseeching God for her healing when he probably felt like saying, kill her. Huh? Now, I'm coming to a close here. Have you ever displeased the Lord? Have you ever made him angry or displeased by complaining? No matter what the complaint, maybe he wasn't happy with the food he provided, maybe he wasn't happy with the leadership he provided, or you're not happy with the inheritance that he's got for you. I hope the goodness you have a good mediator. Meek leadership, why? Because if you don't, I mean, you're in trouble in very short order. Israel had Moses and as an intercessor. I have Jesus Christ as mine. Oh, thank you, Lord. Say, so why? Take you over in the New Testament again. If we sin, not when we sin, if we sin, 
we have an advocate with the Father. What's an advocate? A lawyer. What's the lawyer do? He stands between the guilty and the judge. Uh, we have a mediator. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. I've been in a lot of trouble and probably be in more trouble before I get out of this life. But I have Jesus Christ to go to as my mediator. And I want to tell you, he's a meek man too. He's merciful. He's full of grace. I'm thankful for that. Yes, we have a mediator. Please do not make the mediator mad. Wow. If God or the man of God, or both at the same time is displeased, it's time for you to straighten up or you're in very deep trouble very quickly. Would you stand this morning? <clears throat> Say, oh, I don't complain about food. I don't complain about spiritual leadership. Never complained about my inheritance, haven't got it yet. But I did complain about the weather this week. Who gave the weather? <laughs> oh, it's human. It's human to murmur, grumble, and complain. But I'm calling upon the church today. We need to come before the face of God. Ask God to be merciful towards our sin. Not intentional. Lord, we're not meaning to make you angry. We're not meaning to displease the leadership. We're just human beings and we fail. Lord, would you help me this morning? If you'll pray that kind of prayer, he'll meet you. Yes, he will. He will meet you. Amen. Without further ado, this morning, would you just make your way towards